been extremely good weather the past couple of days, has it not? That's right. And I must say, if you were here last week, we talked about being able to handle things that are going tough, and I told you that I, I fall apart whenever the dirt blows. <laughs> so that Tuesday after that, my son has a baseball game, and I don't know where this weather came from, but it just blew dirt. And somebody had to stay out there and watch all the equipment, and guess who got picked? I learned through adversity to go, God, you still are good. So I've made some steps. Thank you very much. I'm getting better. I'm getting better. I am excited about this morning. Um, I know right now that, that many of you in this room are, are dealing with some, some tough things, and some of you in this room are celebrating some things and are excited. And in all these things that are great, we should praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. So this morning, let's make sure that our hearts are open to say thank you, Jesus, for everything you've done and that you're going to continue to do in our life. We all have an opportunity right now at this moment to spend time with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Last week, we talked about that he is here. It's not one of these things that we learn about him and then go try to find him. He is here. And he's alive today just as much as he was back then, just as much as he will be tomorrow. And he is for us and not against us. Let me go ahead and rephrase that. He is for us according to his glory, not against us, right? Sometimes we mess that one up. He is for me in what I want. Hold on a second. <laughs> Let's talk about how well what you have wanted has worked out so far. Now it's time to put down our will before the Father and say, not mine, Father, but yours be done. And then watch us experience this peace that surpasses all understanding. I want to open up this morning by asking a question. Have you ever messed up? Anyone? None. Those of you who are here who are perfect, we thank you for being here. As an example to all of us on how we must live. As I was preparing this and, and going, yes, have I ever messed up? And, and I started thinking about it. And before you know it, it's, it's been quite an, um, an amount of time. And I'm pulling up all these things where I messed up to where I just start laughing going, man, I am really worthless without you. And I know according to our culture, that is a very derogatory statement of self. But I'm here to tell you. In, in the, the world of Christ and his heavens, that is a beautiful statement. Lord, I, I'm just worthless without you. All but with you, I am the righteousness of God. With you, I'm forgiven. With you, I'm more than a conqueror. With you, I can become better. But apart from you, I can do nothing. Why is that so hard for us to grasp? Because if we would just look at those times when we've messed it up, there's some of us that really, really have a lot of regrets. But how many of us can go back and change those? We can't. But if we continue to live in our past, then we will never be able to step forward in our future. We will never be able to become different. And this morning, understand that anything that happened before, right now, you can't change. I was back there singing and got the words wrong. You know it's bad when you're praising God, your eyes are closed, you say the wrong word, you got to open them, get the word. Oh, yeah, that's where we are. Uh-huh. Yeah. I can't change that. I can't go back and get the right words down. But the Lord knows my heart, and he, his grace is sufficient, and he understood what I was trying to say, right? right? Understand this, that God is not a judge on American Idol. You need to hear this. He does not look at your performance to determine whether you are good or not. He already knows you're not. Yeah, yeah, that, what that does, it blows everybody's chances of, Jesus is American Idol out of the water. The truth is this. 
the person that comes in with the heart that seems way out of key, but has the right heart, Jesus stands and says, that one is beautiful. That one is perfect because they desire me. So back to this, have you ever messed up? There was a, a moment that came to my mind that I tried to block out that I'm going to share with you. It was one of my most embarrassing moments. I am sitting with someone at, at a restaurant, a local fast food restaurant, and we are talking about some of the problems that this person is having. And where we are sitting, I can see the counter uh, where people order their food. And as this young lady goes up to order her food, we make eye contact and she looks extremely familiar. But I can't quite place how I know her. So just like most pastors, I assume that I have seen her at church. And I remember when we were downtown that she would attend quite regularly. And so I waved at her. And she waved. And I'm talking to the guy that I'm talking to and everything's going. And pretty soon she gets done ordering her meal and, and gets her food and starts walking towards me. And I say, oh no, I got to. I got to stand up and acknowledge her. So I stand up and I walk to her and I go, hey, sweetheart, how are you doing? And she goes, hey. And I went, man, you look great. And she goes, thank you. And I gave her a hug and she came and got to the pat hug, you know. I, okay. And, and I got down and I said, well, it's good to see you and I hope to see you soon. She goes, thank you. And I sit down with my friend, and then she walks to the table right behind me. <laughs> Who was that guy? I don't know. <laughs> and all I could do was see all of heaven laughing <laughs> in the midst of joy. These are things that when we mess up, we, we really don't want to think about them. Now, granted, that was a light one. Believe me, I have my darkness. I have those mess ups that I really don't want to talk about, and I really hope nobody else finds out about it, and, and I hope that Jesus forgets it really quickly. But here's the thing. In our culture, we've created a smoke screen. We've created this, look at me, I got it all together. How many of you in this room will put on your smile even though inside you're falling apart? And, and even to the point that we defend the gospel falsely. How's everything going for you? It's great. Praise God. <laughs> Blessings on you. We try to keep our mistakes secret. And when we do, we end up hiding the work of the Lord. So let me ask you this question. How many of you can say that you've been changed by who Jesus is? Praise the Lord. But when somebody meets who you are now, if they don't know where you came from, they don't really get to see the evidence, especially when you walk around acting like you never used to be that person. That's why a lot of people don't like to go back home during the holidays. Because it's nothing like family to call you on your stuff, amen? I don't care how successful you are. You can become this amazing movie star, get back to your house, and your mama will tell you, you better get those shoes off before you walk on my carpet. You're in my house. Now go outside and take out the trash. Mama, I'm a millionaire. <laughs> this is my house. You better take out the trash. But there's also something beautiful about good homes that the Lord resides in. They also can remind you when you're down and out of who you are, where you came from. Some of you in this room have overcome some amazing obstacles. But you really hope nobody finds out who you used to be. My wife was an athlete in high school. She wasn't very friendly. 
It's okay. She tells this story. She's back there. You can ask her about it. But just for the sake of that, let's just keep everything that's said here, here, okay? <laughs> when I met my wife, she couldn't stand me at all. Didn't like me. And I, would, I knew she didn't like me, so I would mess with her, right? Because that's how boys, when they like girls, that's how we tell you we like you, we mess with you. She would sit right next to me because she had an open seat that was by a friend of mine. And I told the teacher, I have bad eyesight and I can't see. Can I move up? <laughs> yeah, some of you are like, dude, I did that too. So I move up to the seat and she's sitting right there and she's looking at me like, oh my gosh. And I knew it. So what she would do when she was paying attention, I would just stare at her. And you know that awkward moment when you can feel somebody? And I could see your eyes doing this. And then she would turn, and I would turn my eyes just a little bit away. So every time she tried to make eye contact with me, I'd look off and go, what are you looking at? Why are you looking at me? Little did she know that she was staring at the man of her dreams. Thank you. Keep it real. Keep it real. We've all changed. We are all different people. In letting the Lord do his work in you, he will change you. But don't be afraid to share what the Lord has done for you. One of the worst offenses that the church has done to a hurting world is pretend that we used to not hurt. Pretend that we still may not hurt today. Understand this. One of the greatest things that you can do for somebody who is hurting is show them your scars. I know how you feel. Those of you in this room have, who have suffered loss. The best thing that it can heal you in that moment is for you to be approached by somebody who has also suffered loss and says, man, I know how it is. And I know you're mad at God even though you pretend to say you're not. And it's okay, and I'll walk through this with you. We will walk through this thing together. Then what happens is the community begins to become ministers to each other. And pretty soon the Lord just begins to thrive in the midst of the people, and the people continue to get better. When you leave here and go out there, I hope you are the same person in here that you are out there. Maybe I should rephrase that. I hope that you're the same person out there that you are in here, right? Because everybody likes to bring their best in here. The world needs real Christians. Christians that are walking it out. Christians that are imperfect, but do not mind showing that they are forgiven. Showing that they can be changed. No matter what the opposition says, many of us go back to that place where we used to be and say, I'm changed and we hope somebody will embrace us, but instead... We get fingers pointed at us saying, who do you think you are? Do you think you're better than us? And we say, absolutely not, but I am following one who is. And I got to have him. It's amazing to me that growing up in the church, I remember being uh, presented with the opportunity to drink amongst my Christian friends. I know, you're saying, what? Christian children? And alcohol, never. Like I said, I, did, I just heard of this. And I remember telling my friends, man, I, I don't like that stuff. And they're like, oh, Mr. Spiritual, huh? You don't like the beer, do you? You're better than all of us, aren't you? Who do you think you are? And I'm like, no, really, I don't like the taste of beer. It's just gross. And that's why they say it's an acquired taste. But Dr. Pepper's of the father. <laughs> feels good. 
And I remember getting chewed up and spit out by my Christian friends, but then end up in college hanging out with my friends that really weren't Christian, but who were drinkers and said, hey, you want a beer? I'll buy you one. And I said, no, I don't drink. And they go, man, that's cool. And the reason is because I found that in the bar there were some real people. They didn't try to hide who they are. And my question is, when did we at church begin to think that we used to not be the types of people that went to bars? Some of us in this room like, I cannot wait to talk about this sermon tonight at the bar. <laughs> Sinners. <laughs> There's something freeing about admitting that you need help. I'll never forget when I was first married, we didn't have any money. I mean, we didn't have any money. I remember going to my parents' house and my dad trying to give me a $20 bill so I could buy some food for me and my wife. And I said, no, I don't need it. I'm a man. I'll stand on my own two feet. And my dad's like, you're a fool because you won't admit that you need help. We all need help. And there's my wife going, take the money. <laughs> it's okay to need help. Especially if you say, Father, I need your help, that is an extremely powerful statement. I want to read some scripture. It's out of 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to go over this entire chapter. It's not very long. But I want to break it down into two parts. I love this scripture because it's Paul writing to Timothy, a disciple that has followed Paul and has walked with him. You could say that Paul is discipling Timothy, right? Uh, for some of you, Paul is sponsoring Timothy. It's okay to laugh. Paul says this in verse 1, But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Just get a little close, isn't it? Having a form of godliness but denying its power have nothing to do with such people. They are the kind who worm their way into homes and gain control over gullible women who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires. Always learning but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Stop right there. Always learning but never coming to the knowledge of the truth. I know in my life, being birthed and grown in church, I was always learning, but still quite did not know what the truth was. There has to be a moment where the light goes off to where you realize that Jesus is real. That Jesus is not just something that our culture talks about as a historical figure on Sunday morning, but that he is a living God that is with you today. Give me an amen. amen. Verse 8 says, just as, and here's the thing, I do not know how to pronounce these names, so I'm going to say them wrong. Janez and Jambres, see what I should have done is acted like I was really theological and made it sounded Janez and Jambres. West Texas, that's just Janice and Jambres. <laughs> they opposed Moses, so also these teachers opposed the truth. They are men of depraved minds who, as far as the faith is concerned, are rejected, but they will not get very far because, as in the case of those men, their folly will be clear to everyone. We were just describing that current state. Now know this, that back to Janice and Jambres, I did not know who these people were until I researched it. And according to some theologians, this was the two magicians 
that were with Pharaoh when Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, let my people go. And Pharaoh said, no. And so Moses, or I should say Aaron, threw down the staff, and the staff turned into a snake, right? Well, these two magicians came forward, these two, and they had a staff, threw it on the ground, and it also turned into a snake. Now, Scripture does tell us that Moses and Aaron's snake ate their snake. That's right, because God is gangster like that. But here's the point. Magicians need to hide how they do things. David Copperfield cannot be a success if he revealed how his illusions worked. And one time he made the Statue of Liberty disappear. It was gone. But I promise you no planes were going to go fly right by it. Because it really wasn't gone It was illusion to be gone. Here's the beautiful thing about people of God. We need to reveal everything that makes us, that have made us fall, so that we can show how God has changed that within us. In other words, pull back the curtain in your life and say, this is who I used to be. But this is who I am now. How many of you have seen the before and after pictures of weight loss programs? Before, after, and then re-after. Pop, we're back. (laughs) Nothing like losing about 50 pounds to go, woo! Now I could go back to eating the way I used to be and gaining 70. (laughs) Usually happens on the holidays, be careful. But notice that these guys... Eventually, as the Lord began to bring the plagues, the magicians could not match it because they were way out of their league. See, here's the power of Moses. You ready? Here's the power of Moses. Hi, Moses. Uh, God sent me and said, let my people go. So, what do you say? (laughs) No? Okay. There's going to be something that's going to come and you're not going to like it. (laughs) See see you in a week. Can I make an appointment for next week? Okay, thanks, Pharaoh. Pretty soon, here comes a plague. And they begin to ask this question. How is Moses doing this? Study him, follow him, see what he's doing, find out what's going on, find out his trickery so that we may crush him. Next thing you know, they come back, that guy's a doofus, there's nothing special about him. He comes back in next week, hi, it's uh, Moses again, good good to see you I guess. Um, God said, let my people go. No. Okay. See you next week. And here comes something else. And something else. And pretty soon, here's what Pharaoh begins to realize. I'm not talking to Moses. I'm not talking to Moses. I'm talking to God. I'm talking to something that is far greater than Moses, far greater than me. How beautiful would that be that as people begin to talk to you, they begin to realize that's just not who I used to know. There's something different in them talking to me. Something more powerful, something better than them that is guiding their life. That is when the world goes, Jesus must be real. That's what's powerful. And right now we're in a culture that likes to debate whether something exists or it doesn't. We're in debates right now to to decide if the the person Jesus Christ really ever existed, or if all these miracles really happened, or if it was just science. Honestly, I could care less. But Travis, if we can prove that Moses did not cross the Jordan, will you still believe? 
yes. But Travis, if we can prove that there really was not a man named Jesus who died on the cross, would you still believe? Yep. But Travis, if we can prove that scripture was really written by a man and not the breath of God, will you still believe? Yes. Well, then, Travis, you're just a fool. Yes. <laughs> Praise him. <laughs> Travis, tell me why you believe. Because I know who I used to be. And I know who I am now. And there's nothing you can say that would disprove my experience with Jesus. So prove what you shall. I will be the one praising his name. I've said this story before and I need to say it again. I think it is quite amazing. When we go to our district assembly, they have all these books that are out there that are free to pastors to come and take. And usually it's books that are used by uh, other pastors. And what I try to do is I try to go find the oldest books I can possibly find. And I found this one. It was taught, and what it was talking about was the stories of evangelists in the 1800s. And that interests me because evangelism in the 1800s was a lot different than what we see now. See, back then they used to go into a town and stand at the town square and begin to share the love of Christ. And sometimes they were ran out. Sometimes they were accepted. Well, in this one instance, there was an evangelist who came out and stood at the town square and began to talk about the hope of Jesus Christ. But in this town were universities of thought, of higher learning. And so as they found that there was an evangelist at the town square, many of the professors came out and began to debate the evangelist. Begin to say, how can you preach this? Because you have no proof that God exists. And the evangelists just continued to speak and share love and hope. And, and people were beginning to absolutely hear it and love it. And pretty soon more professors showed up and said, we require you to stop talking until you can prove it. We challenge you to a debate. Because our science can prove what we believe, but you have nothing to prove what you believe. And this is what the evangelist says. I will give you your debate. And they got excited. Because it's on. We're going to prove God wrong. And this is what the evangelist said. You go get all your professors and get all your material together and be able to present your facts. Because you will go first. And then I'm going to bring three people. For your debate will not be with me. It will be with these three. It will be an alcoholic who no longer drinks. It will be a man who used to beat his wife that no longer does. And it will be a woman who used to be a prostitute who has found Christ as her Lord and Savior. Your job serves to prove to them that God is not real. Good luck with that. The second part of this, and this is beautiful, Paul writes to Timothy and says, You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecution, sufferings, what kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. The persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, listen to this, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Who's ready to sign up? Act now. Do you notice what Paul is doing? Timothy, you know God is real because you've seen him working in my life. You understand what he's saying to him, Timothy, you've seen all the junk I've gone through. You've seen all the problems I have, and you've seen how God has moved in my life. That is proof that he exists. Yet, unfortunately, as our Christian culture, we would much rather just sit and be comfortable and keep everyone away from our scars. And we wonder why. People have a hard time believing that there's a God. Can I get an amen? amen? Verse 13, while evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, 
deceiving and being deceived, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it. You know me. And how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The reason why I have no problem degrading myself is because I am more ecstatic about what Jesus has done in me than what I have, could have ever accomplished by myself. Do you understand that? What use is it for me to gain everything and yet not have the Lord? In other words, when I sit and meet with someone, I hope that they see what Christ has done in my life rather than how well I am learned, right? It's like this. If I was to sit there and pray for you and you were to come to me and say, Pastor, when did you learn to pray like that? And I say, well, it was one day when I was fasting before the Lord that I said, Lord, teach me thouest prayers and the Spirit of God came upon me and now I have been given the gift of prayerism. And I walk around with my chest out, barely bending my knees. When the truth is, that day I forgot my wallet and couldn't go in and eat, so I couldn't have lunch. And so instead I threw a fit out in the car, and God began to call me on my stuff, and I did business with the Lord and learned how to pray. Sounds much better, Pastor, when you said it the first way. Yeah. Yeah. That's what's so awesome about those of you who've been locked up and found Christ. What a great conversion story, right? My conversion story, I grew up in the church, and one day the Lord called me and said, Travis, come forth. And I floated forth to the altar. And the angels descendeth down upon me. And I said the sinner's prayer. And then the angels applauded as if in a golf clap. People have been locked up. What happened? Got busted, locked up, found Jesus. <laughs> How'd you do that? Well, that's all I had time to do is read the Bible. And next thing you know, bing. Oh. Imagine that. He's real. And you know what's amazing about those of you who come out? You begin actually to be worried about being back in the world. Isn't it funny that when you were locked up, life made more sense? It was about him. But man, we get out in this world and there's all this maneuvering. Oh, who's God? What's God? Are you sure? President Obama, he's Satan, right? Oh, he's this. Oh, and what about this and that? And, and oh, and then, did, oh, this guy's the Messiah. And this guy's, just, oh, but it's the church Christ. And, oh, it's the Nazarenes who are holy. Oh, it's the Roman Catholics because Peter started and all these different things. And the next thing you wonder why people go, I'm just not sure about this Jesus stuff. Hey, come here, man. Let me show you something. That who I used to be. And this is who Jesus has made me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. You can take it or leave it, but it's real for me. That's right. That's when somebody goes, I got I to gotta get some of that. Because that junk's real. And what better people to be real than the people that are sitting in here, amen? amen. Praise the Lord. Timothy has seen the proof of God by the life of Paul. I think this is extremely important. The world will see the evidence of God by, by our life, by how we live it, not by where we attend church. The world will see Jesus as real, not how we praise God when everything's going great, but how we praise God when everything's falling apart. 
The world will know that we are of him by how well we love one another, not talk about each other behind each other's back. He is looking for real people to be real broken, to really surrender. And hear this, to be really freed by the Son of God. I have a picture of a vase that I want to show you. I think it's an extremely pretty vase. Isn't that pretty? It is. It's like we come to people and we say, you see how beautiful this is? This is God. Now become this. Make one of these vases. And you will be found approved by God, right? And what happens is people go, how do we do that? We're not showing you how. Just become this. And here's what happens. We begin to polish ourselves up. We begin to walk around bigger and act like we are a vase. And the truth is not, we're spittoon. <laughs> right? <laughs> Some of you in here are dating yourself. <laughs> All the good old days, anyway. What we don't want to see is how this stuff is made, like this. It's dirty. It's messy. It spins around and around and around. And I guarantee you, that clay does not know which way is up or which way is down. It's just the potter is Y'all seen this? Many of you girls are going, and then I remember when the hands came in with him. Oh, no. <laughs> so beautiful. Oh, oh, I miss Patrick Swayze. He's so beautiful. <laughs> but they do, and this thing spins, and you know what happens whenever the clay gets out of sort? Because if you go too fast, it'll spill over. If you go too slow, it digs the fingers in too much. It has to be perfect. And what happens if it gets out of shape? It's got to start over. So guess what the potter does? Bam, bam, bam. And he pulls and he prods and he gets it all back to where it's nothingness. So he does with us. Not because he's punishing you, but because he loves you. Pretty soon he puts this mud back on it to where you get slick and ointment and grace and love. And pretty soon he starts spinning. Sitting that thing again, stepping on the wheel, and it starts spinning, and he begins to bring you up. His hands are dirty. He's sweating. He's getting this stuff together, but he's going to make that beautiful vase because that's who he created you to be. I want to end with this scripture in Isaiah 64, 6 through 8. It is perfect. All of us have become like one who is unclean. Say amen. And all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Say amen. We all shrivel up like a leaf and like the wind our sins sweep us away. No one calls on your name or strives to lay hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and have given us over to our sins. Say amen. Verse 8. Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Oh, man. Back to that being surrendered. I can't do it without him. So, Lord, if you got to pound me up to get me right, do so. Amen? And, Father, you do your thing with me. And that way, I'll be able to become a beautiful vase, but also share I used to be crumpled up clay. Can I get an amen? We are all created to be beautiful in the sight of the Lord. And if you do not believe this, whatever your past is, we talked about that already. It doesn't matter. He does not forget his children. So I say today, even though you may be clay and you're a mess, it's only a matter of time before you become a beautiful vase. If you let him do his thing. Give me an amen.
Let's stand together. Grab the hand of the person next to you, please. Father, we come to you this morning, and I thank you so much for being a God that is hands-on. But Father, you are not a God that is a judge waiting to give us a grade on our effort. But Father, that you have already allowed us to give ourselves an F. But Father, that you are the one who comes in and changes us. So Father, I pray right now, in the midst of this people, your children, Lord, that you would do all you have in mind with us. Father, that you would change us and may we never be ashamed of what you have done in our life. Father, may we be so bold to show the world that we were once lost, but now we are found. Father, that there used to be a dark day, but now today the sun shines. Father, may the people who've been redeemed by the Lord stand up and say so. We love you, Jesus. Continue to mold us into your children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go and love well.